ahead on 12 News, honoring a longtime Palmer Lake Elementary teacher. She was the kind of teacher that was just so giving and classy. Plus, a controversial plan to increase recycling in Minnesota. Why some say it's a good idea, why others say it could be a burden. But first, a plan to help fill a growing need. It's really not a question of, you know, do we have a problem? We do. The question is, what can we do? 12 News starts right now. Hello everyone and thanks for joining us. Brooklyn Park is moving forward on a plan to build a homeless shelter for youth in the northwest suburbs. The city's Economic Development Authority voted to continue working with a nonprofit group and other community leaders to make the dream a reality. Here's Cassie Bonstrom. This homeless shelter for youth in North Minneapolis serves about 20 kids every night, but there's nothing like it anywhere in the suburbs. Suburban youth shouldn't have to leave home. They should be able to stay close to school, close to their family and friends close to their work. Deb Loon and her nonprofit organization Avenues for Homeless Youth has teamed up with city officials and church leaders to build a similar facility in Brooklyn Park. This isn't just a Brooklyn Park issue. This is a no northwest suburban issue. The shelter will serve a growing need. In 2013, the Osseo School District identified more than 500 students as homeless. In the Anoka Hennepin District, more than 700. People think that you build a homeless shelter and people, they'll come, they're here. Brooklyn Park Mayor Jeff Lundy wants his community to be a model for tackling homelessness head on. It's really not a question of, you know, do we have a problem? We do. The question is, what can we do? The proposal involves the city buying and renovating a space. They would then lease the space to Avenues for Youth, who would run the shelter. There would be 8 to 10 beds for youth between the ages of 16 and 21. Right now, the next big step involves the city buying that space. One likely option is near County Road 81 and 69th Avenue North. Then they need the money, money to sustain the shelter, which will cost about $600,000 per year. This is not an inexpensive kind of program to run. It is a big project, but one Deb says is worth the investment. That's why we do this. Um, these kids just need a little bit of support and the future's bright. Now, as of now, the plan is to open the shelter by September of this year, so in just nine months. But to do that, they really need the community's financial support. So if viewers would like to help out, there is a link to their fundraising site, and I will put that on our website at 12.tv. They need quite a bit of money, about $150,000 just from the community. Wow. All right. Good start. All right. Yep. Thank Thanks you. Thanks a lot, Cassie. Why didn't someone think of this a while back? That's the glowing reaction toward a new plan to house Osseo police. The city is looking at ways to replace its small 1930s home that currently serves as police headquarters. The new plan would simply build an addition to the west side of City Hall. It also takes advantage of underutilized City Hall storage space that could be used for police locker rooms. The cost is easier to stomach, too. It's all about bringing in the numbers and being responsible with the money. That's that's the big thing. And, you know, as opposed to letting it creep up to 1.2, 1.3, 1.4, this $800,000 mark is a lot more palatable. The city council approved spending $5,500 for an architect to produce drawings of the proposed addition. If it's eventually approved, administrative staff, police, fire, and the library and community center would all be under one roof. Governor Mark Dayton will have to find a new running mate in his re-election bid this fall. Lieutenant Governor Yvonne Pretner Solon will step down at the end of the year. The decision is not a surprise. Months ago, the 67-year-old from Duluth had expressed reservations about running again. Pretner Solon is Minnesota's sixth consecutive woman to serve as lieutenant governor. The president of North Hennepin Community College may not be coming back to that job after all. John O'Brien left North Hennepin last summer to take an interim position as Minsk's vice chancellor for academic and student affairs. Now he's in the running to be named to that position permanently. The Minsk board may make a decision next week. O'Brien served as North Hennepin president for three years. Efforts to boost the state's recycling rate could include a 10-cent deposit on any drink container. In 2006, the state set a goal for recycling 80% of all drink containers by 2012, but we're still not even halfway there. Lawmakers could consider this session whether adding a 10-cent deposit on each beverage container would give people more incentive to recycle because they could get money back. However, the proposal also has costs associated with it, including making sure there are recycling centers that could handle the volume. How do we deal with 
Recycling, I think, is a very important topic. Um, you know, it obviously has a big environmental impact, um, but there's also a big, I mean, there's a big industry in Minnesota, too, as far as, re as recycling. So to the extent we can, we want to be, you know, don't want to disrupt that unnecessarily. I think when you look at consumers and consumer spending and how these programs are administered and the cost of them, this proposal is over a $200 million infrastructure proposal a year to operate the system. It's a concern. The proposal was discussed in a House committee hearing in St. Paul. She taught in the Osseo School District for more than three decades. And teachers and staff at Palmer Lake Elementary School in Brooklyn Park are mourning the loss of teacher Sandra Legg. Mrs. Legg lost her battle with ovarian cancer on January 8th. 12 News reporter Sonia Goen shows us how her death is impacting the whole community. There once was a boy named Drew. On candy, he'd chomp and he'd chew. Devaney Albers is a sixth grade teacher at Palmer Lake Elementary. I've known her for 30 years. Albers says Sandy Legg was more than a co-worker. They had a lot of synergy together. And that the two shared a common rhythm. We planned things together before school and after school. This is her room. Room 45 will never be the same. To me, it will always be her room. Always because we just spent so much time in it. Mrs. Legg taught sixth grade in the same classroom for 39 years until she retired last year. And so she had this big map of the world in the back of her room. Even though Mrs. Legg battled ovarian cancer for many years, her death was still a shock to the staff. It was really tragic. We all just kind of really lost our breath a little bit um, because she was just here teaching with us last year. Go to your definitions. But her legacy continues to live on with the Palmer Lake Panthers. It's not uncommon for people to just drop in here to the school in their 30s and 40s and just ask, does Miss Legg still teach here? Legg's co-workers say just being around her made them better people. She was the kind of teacher that was just so giving and classy and professional. She made me up my game, made me a better principal to work with her. Legg also shared a unique bond with her students. We went to a lot of graduations together where we were invited when kids graduated from Park Center. It was all about respect, and she always got it because she just always gave it. Review just a little bit what is alliteration. That same respect was extended to her fellow teachers and staff. And I guess what I'll remember is that she always called me sir. Um. She was very creative and um, energetic. This yearbook picture shows off her bubbly personality. She's just really vivacious. They will miss her smile and hard work. One of those rare teachers that just keeps getting better with age. She was a teacher's teacher. She just kept on getting better. Besides a co-worker, she was a friend, yes, very definitely. In Brooklyn Park, Sonia Goins, 12 News. Sandra Legg was 61 years old. She also lived in Robbinsdale. Her funeral is Wednesday at 11 o'clock at Peace Lutheran Church in Robbinsdale. Well, coming up, a worry for every parent expecting children. And it's a worry for good reason, how birth defects are more common than you might think. And later in sports, an Osseo basketball standout now tops the scoring list at his school. But first, snow emergencies are in effect, and keep an eye on Wednesday's forecast, a chance for freezing rain in the afternoon. This week marks the 50th anniversary of the Thur Surgeon General's landmark report on smoking and health. In Minnesota, 16% of the population still smokes and it's still the number one preventable cause of death. Tobacco prevention advocates say there's still work to do at the state level and one of the biggest challenges is to decrease tobacco use among teens and deal with the advent of electronic cigarettes. We were very pleased that last year we saw a, a large uh, cigarette tax increase uh, passed at the state level. Uh, this year we are looking at uh, smoke-free uh, foster homes and we are also um, interested in uh, making sure that the, the state's existing tobacco laws are applied to e-cigarettes. Clearway, Minnesota says 5,000 Minnesotans still die every year because of tobacco use. Birth defects are common, costly, and critical in that it could impact an infant for life. January is National Birth Defect Prevention Month. Experts say some are unavoidable, but there are some things expectant mothers can do to help ensure a healthy baby. Kaya Edwards has more in today's Health Check. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. I know you don't like it. Crying, the sound of a healthy baby. Six pounds, 15 ounces. 
<laughs> 20 inches. And the measurements to match. Randy and Joe Bailey of Rogers, Minnesota, recently welcomed their baby girl, Clara, into the world. There's a four year gap between our first and this one, so we're. We kind of feel like new parents again, I mean, <laughs> read, learn, and everything. But they haven't had too much to figure out on their own. There you go. That's because Minnesota doctors are in on the national conversation. I think people aren't as aware as they could be. Um, I think people will have a couple cigarettes and think it's not going to harm anything. In all factuality, they'll have a smaller baby. Alcohol and drug abuse are also on the not to-do list. The Minnesota Department of Health says birth defects affect one in every 33 babies born in the U.S., creating costs of $2.6 billion per year. They stay admitted into the hospital, they get weaned off of their dependence issues, they get medications. I mean, it is a process and it doesn't just take a couple days. They can be here for weeks. Preventative actions include regularly going to checkups, taking prenatal vitamins, and maintaining a healthy diet. This new mom did all of the above. I always tried to have open communication if I was having any issues, not to be embarrassed, just because you wanted everything to come out great for the baby. For Health Check, Kaya Edwards, 12 News. <laughs> Cute. There are also ways to prevent birth defects even before pregnancy, like taking doses of doctor-recommended medications. This can be especially helpful to women with a family history of medical complications. Well, coming up, how that ugly bathroom of yours could be worth a grand in prize money. But first in sports, why Park Center has one of its best gymnastics teams in a long time. John Jacobson takes a look at the team when we come back. John Jacobson with sports. Now we start with a high school senior basketball player who's had a pretty good high school career, I'll say. I mean, <laughs> pretty nice, yeah. And hit a milestone last week, and still some games to play for him uh, this year. He hit the game-winning shot that gave Osseo a state boys basketball title two seasons ago. Now Orioles senior Ian Tyson has another accomplishment to add to his list. His six-foot-nine-inch Tyson, seen here in an earlier game, broke Osseo's career scoring mark this past Thursday against Coon Rapids. Tyson surpassed early 2000s sharpshooter Brian Foss by one point. And it's quite a thrill for Tyson. It means a lot to me, you know, a lot of hard work I've put into these past, you know, four and a half years. And it uh, means a lot to kind of be, kind of be the man, you know, leading scorer at Oslo. It speaks a, uh, it speaks a lot because uh, Oslo has been a great po uh, program for the past 20, 30 years. So it means a lot to kind of be at the top of the list with everybody else. You know, I've been a part of Osseo basketball now for 20 years in some capacity, whether it's assistant coach or varsity coach, and it did make me go back through the record book and remember a lot of good, important basketball players here. And now to see Ian's name at the top of the scoring list, as well as the top of the rebounding list, is something to be very, very proud of. South Dakota State signee Tyson still has about half of a senior season to add to his total. The Orioles are at Elk River Tuesday night. And here's a look at the top 10 in Osseo history with Tyson now at the top of the list ahead of Foss and Xavier Reed. Current Gonzaga senior center Sam Dower is at number six. 2012 Mr. Football winner Bridge Tussler is ninth. And while most of the players are a fairly recent vintage, early 1970s standout, Warren Huss is still holding on to the 10th spot. Success in any athletic endeavor is often measured in numbers, high or low, depending on the sport. One local high school gymnastics team is reaching numbers not seen in years. Coach Bruce Smith has long stated that the Park Center gymnastics team is more about getting girls involved in the sport rather than winning. But winning occasionally doesn't hurt either. The Pirates scored 126.95 in the recent MG GOA meet in Roseville. Then followed that up with a 127.875 score against Maple Grove. The highest score for a Park Center team in years. And the program's first ever win over the Crimson. That was very exciting. Um, we ex I expected to get um, close, like within a close range with the scores. I didn't expect to win. It was really like exciting to know that this is our first time winning against Maple Grove in 17 years and having the scores be what they were at the end of last season, be what they are at the beginning of this season, I think it's just everyone feels very accomplished of themselves. Two eighth graders, Haley Illy 
and Alexa Masters are new to the team after years of competing in club gymnastics at Twin City Twisters. That's definitely given a boost to the Pirates' scores and pushed the other girls to work harder. They kind of like bring the spirit to the team. They're like more energetic than us high schoolers. <laughs> it's been very fun watching everybody improve and get better from last year and the years before I've been on the team. The girls have been working really hard and we had a good nucleus coming in and they've, they've been able to put it together. It's truly a team effort on this. With 47 girls in the gym, this is still a big program, one that finds a place for every athlete. We're still serving all the kids who didn't come out of the club. You know, we've always prided ourselves that anybody can walk in this gym and be on our team. They may not make the top five, but they can be on the team. Park Center has conference meets scheduled for each of the next four Thursdays, including this week when they host Elk River. The regular season in girls hockey ends in just over two weeks. On this week's Sports Jam show here on Channel 12, Jason Melillo profiles Champlin Park goalie Hannah Ghetto. Here's a clip from that story. Gettle has played on the Rebels varsity since her freshman season and gained valuable experience along the way, but she also has that particular demeanor that's so important for a goalie. Quietly confident, always focused, and never getting too high or too low. I'm just very relaxed. I don't panic or anything. Um, it's really weird. I actually don't think when I play, so I mean, a lot of the stuff I do is this reaction to everything, so I mean, that's pretty nice for me. I mean, she'll stand up and make the shot. She likes to be comfortable making the plays. The biggest thing with her, she's super confident and she's super smooth and seems always in control no matter how much pressure's on top of her. Catch the rest of Hannah's story and all the week's prep highlights on Sports Jam. It's on through Wednesday at 3 30, 6 30, and 9 30 p.m. on Channel 12. And that's a look at sports for today. All right, thanks, John. Still ahead, extra incentive to fix the ugliest room in your house. We'll be right back. Well, finally, life can be filled with frustration, but perhaps nothing can be more agonizing than, say, a bad bathroom or a cruddy kitchen. And now there's a way to possibly remove the ugly from your home. You may be able to enter a contest called Operation Rescue Room. It's open to residents in Golden Valley and also those in the Hopkins School District. The contest is part of the West Metro Home Remodeling Fair held next month in Hopkins. And to enter the contest, all you need to do is write a 100-word description of your nightmare room. Entries will be accepted through February 15th, and to learn more, you can go to 12.tv and click on Featured Links. 100 words is not a lot, though, so you got to be you descriptive no, about that room. Just Sounds just like just words. like the words. And you get, what, $1,000 yes. towards a fix? That's not too bad. Time. That's right. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> That's it for us. We'll see you back here tomorrow, beginning at 4.